Good morning to anybody who has joined. We're going to get started here at 10 o'clock sharp, just in a under a minute. It's good to see a fair number of folks outside the Forest Service are joining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Science You Can Use Spring 2022 webinar series. Um, we're so happy you've joined us today. Um, myself, I'm Jessica Bruin. I work for science delivery for the Rocky Mountain Research Station um, and the headquarters out of Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, today we have um, David Wright joining us. He's the backup facilitator in case um, my internet decides to um, do something crazy. Uh, we have uh, Tisha Street, who's um, running the background um, tech support today. So Tisha will be providing um, a link for the closed captioning um, in the chat. So if you need that, um, if there's any media present today, uh, we will post the contact information uh, for Lisa Bryant. She's a public affairs specialist. Um, that will also be posted in the chat today. So our great topic of the day is a modern approach to quantifying ungulate carrying capacity by Dr. Matt Reeves. Um, we will also, let's see, be um, continuing this series um, into April. So um, there'll be a flyer that will be posted in the chat also uh, just for the future topics. We will be recording today and uh, the recordings and the slides will be available on the Rocky Mountain Research Station website under products and webinars. Um, we'll be posting that in the future. Uh, today's format is a 30 minute presentation and then we should have about 30, 20 to 30 minutes for question and answer uh, session. We invite you to uh, type your questions in the chat at any time. Um, we will invite you to turn your cameras on and ask questions in person once the presentation is done. And then if you uh, would kindly do so, please stay muted during uh, Matt's presentation um, and we will get to uh, Q&A after that. So at this point, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matt Reeves. Um, he's a research ecologist with the Human Dimensions Program with the Rocky Mountain Research Station here to present for us today. So I'll hand it over to you, Matt. I will stop sharing and give you the floor. Good, thank you for doing that. I didn't know if you wanted me to stay muted during my presentation or not, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> nope, we're okay. ready for you. Go for Good. it. Okay, well, thanks for, for joining me, everybody. I'm glad to see this many people, again, outside the Forest Service uh, joining us. I don't have a, a head count, but it looks like a fair number. So that's a nice thing to see. Um, but as mentioned, we're going to talk about what I'm calling a modern approach to estimating carrying capacity for ungulates, but um, it stems from work that, that I think many of you may be familiar with in the past, but we do bring a modern approach. Now, I do want to thank uh, my collaborator in this project, Michael Krebs in Missoula, Montana. He is a a collaborator who works with me on a variety of venues, but this is one of them. And we're employing this type of work in a couple of areas. And you'll see a couple of case studies as we move through the presentation where we employ these technologies, but primarily in region three. So that'd be New Mexico and Arizona, some in, in region five, which is predominantly California and a little bit in region four in Utah specifically. So all those areas now, we are working with our colleagues there, primarily Forest Service personnel, but also some BLM folks to address different issues related to carrying capacity. So I wanted to set the stage and make sure we're all talking about the same thing um, because not everyone yeah, is familiar with ungulates, probably heard the term, but everything in this picture, and I had to do some snooping, I'm not a phylogeneticist um, or anything like this, um, but I, I do want you to realize that, that anything in this picture would be an ungulate. Now, of course, uh, and there are many more, these are just examples, but in general, it's the, the, the animals with hooves 
Let's just make it simple and call it that. But for our purposes today, of course, we're not worried about rhinos or killer whales, even though killer whales don't have hooves. That surprised me. Some people call them, call them ungulates. I don't know why. Um, but uh, what we're primarily interested in is things here um, around our necks of the woods. So predominantly um, domesticated livestock, so cattle and horses could be sheep, although in our examples, it's not. Uh, but also the wild uh, ungulates as well. So the elk, deer, the antelope, the bighorn sheep, and animals like that. So that kind of sets a stage for what ungulates are. And of course, they're going to have a limited number um, on the landscape that, that uh, there can be at any one time or even over time. So that's part of what we're talking about today. So these are hooved critters. And we're primarily concerned in this talk, as I said, with the herbivores, and these, these are, uh, we're gonna be focused on ruminants. So the four chambers of the stomach type of animals, like I said, the elk, the deer, the wild domestic sheep, et cetera. Now, this is not really uh, carrying capacity by, um, uh, you know, like a wildlife population perspective where we look at things like, um, you know, predators and disease and the, the political concerns and all these things that may drive populations and how big they can get. But instead, we're primarily focused on how much forage is available for ungulates in a given area. And by available, I mean, we really peel back the layers of the onion to look at truly what's available. And that's part of what makes this a modern approach. So we do not the predators and the diseases and that sort of thing, but overall just what the, what the landscape tells us um, irrespective of, of uh, predators and diseases. Now, as you might know, a large part of public policy and administration has, has a concern with this carrying capacity type of issue. And things like the Wild Horse and Burrow Act of 71, Public, public Rangers Improvement Act, the Taylor Grazing Act of 34, et cetera. These are all things that can, we can concern ourselves with the carrying capacity or how many animals can we realistically support on a given year and importantly how does that vary through time and and how do our concerns impact that number and of, as you know managers in in the agencies and on on private lands keep very close on these things because we don't want to put too many animals in any one place to to um for too long because as you know that can lead to some some poor effects on the landscape and we don't want to create those unhealthy rangeland situations. And also the idea of carrying capacity and its importance and how it varies um, from region to region or from district to district is a big part of our allotment management plans and the like. So we have grazing allotments and attached to each one of those, at least in the Forest Service, we have a plan that tells us in general uh, how many, you know, the types of concerns and how many of what type of animal we want to uh, allow to be there. So this is really a juggling act. Um, there has been trial and error over the decades on what this really means. I mean, range management is, is uh, probably more of an art than a science. So there's some trial and error that occurs here, but we have some good principles to build upon when we're doing this kind of exercise. But there's so many things that you would need to consider um, if you really want to peel back the layers of the onions. For example, we might want to enable some kind of uh, herbivory by domesticated sheep and cattle, but we also would need to concern, well, are there wildlife that, that would conflict with those uses? For example, we might see a bighorn sheep in an area. We might want to reserve a certain amount of forage for them. We might want to reserve a certain amount of standing dead material for sage grouse and those sorts of considerations. Other considerations would be you know, things like, has there been a fire recently? Has there been some other kind of disturbance where maybe some added rest might be warranted? Um, and that's the type of thing where, you know, the layers get pretty deep pretty fast. And we don't, un we don't look at each of these layers in this, what you're going to see today in our brief case study. But I just want you to understand there's a lot of things that factor into this question of, of capacity. Now, our work that we're going to talk about this modern approach stems from, you know, for those of you who are in the range management world, the Holacek kind of 1988 um, setting stocking rate approach, but we, uh, I think, kind of push that to its limits and, and modernize it a bit. And those are the elements we're going to talk about today. But in our 
in our uh, view or in our um, world, if you will, uh, while there may be other concerns, you are going to be limited by the types of data you can bring to bear realistically to a situation. So it's good to consider all these things, but if you don't have data for them, it's not going to help. Well, you, you would want to concern things like phenology, what about the palatability and the structure of the vegetation? How tall is it? How thick is it? And what's the regrowth potential? Is there warm season species, cool season species, you know, C, C4, C3? Um, do we have to concern ourselves with bimodal precipitation, et cetera? What about the annual production and the uh, slope? So how steep is the landscape? What about distance from water? And then these are the types of things we actually address, but there are many others that, that, we, don't, that we don't address and certainly not in this topic or in, in this uh, presentation today. So let's get started here and get down to some more basics to understand the, the building blocks of this modern approach. Think of something like creosote bush, uh, Laria tridentata. So we ask ourselves a desert species, we ask ourselves the question, um, okay, we've got a landscape, let's say this is in a grazing allotment, do we want to consider this in the forage pool? And most of you are probably saying, yeah, probably not. And you'd be correct because in our two examples here, we have a, on the left, the, the horned critter, this is a Criollo um, species of, of cattle. It's much a hardier, uh, um, used in the Southwest quite a bit. And so they tend to eat brush a lot more than this, this cow on the right, which I believe is a black Angus. Um, the issue is neither of these subspecies is gonna be interested in creosote bush. So these get kind of a, a negative response, if you will. What about another type of ungulate, mule deer? Nah, they're not gonna utilize much creosote bush either. Um, so we would not want to include creosote bush then in most of our evaluations of carrying capacity in terms of what the animals can eat. Um, what, about, what about rabbit brush, Chrysothamnus species? Nah, not really. Our, our cattle uh, examples here, either Criollo or this Angus, are going to be interested much in the rabbit brush. Okay, well, let's switch a little bit to something more interesting. And this matters to how we evaluate and calculate carrying capacity uh, across the range. What about cat claw acacia? Um, the Criollo cows, uh, cattle, yeah, they might browse it a little here and there. And how do you know how much? Well, it depends on what else is available. It depends on um, also the experience of the cattle that are there or the other types of livestock, you know, what, what they prefer. And the only way we get that information as scientists is by working with managers and talking with them very in depth about what's going on in their neck of the woods. And then what about mountain mahogany? Absolutely, that uh, Criollo breed is gonna be pretty happy nibbling on the bush on the bottom, but not our Angus here. So we've got to really concern ourselves with breed. What about the, cons the, the consideration of these grass species? Curly mesquite, some three on, yeah, three on early in the year, but both of our, both of the, the, the livestock in this example, the Angus and the Criollo, both are going to be pretty happy with this situation. So that gets a, a thumbs up for sure. Okay, let's talk about uh, vegetation structure a bit, because we might know how much vegetation is there, maybe from a remote sensing perspective, but it has to be available spatially. I mean, they got to be able to reach it. So if we look at something like this mesquite tree, um, do we think the cows are going to be able to the cattle here. And uh, no, neither species is going to be very successful. What about this, this poor horse here that's very hungry? And this is a real situation on many of our ranges. Uh, yeah, actually, this happens. They stand on their hind legs and they eat uh, the mesquite in, in very severe situations. Would we want to factor that into capacity? No, because it's a sign of bad things that are happening. My point is just to say that you could factor in these types of situations. Okay, taking one step back a little bit and looking at a landscape. Let's look at a variety and talk about distance to water. Um, what about our, our Criollo, the one on the right? Will it go five miles from water? Maybe, it won't be too happy about it, but it could. And so these kinds of considerations um, come in with our consultations with managers. 
Maybe it's three miles, maybe it's five, maybe it's seven. It just depends on the terrain, the experience of the animals there and what kind they are. How about elk? Yeah, no problem. How about that, that, uh, that poor horse here? No problem. Mm, the Angus in the upper left here, that's mm, pretty doubtful, especially in this terrain. Um, what about slope? Um, again, the Angus, not gonna be very happy about a 50% slope. The elk will, will use it. They don't, they don't particularly like it, but they'll definitely use it. The uh, wild horse and burros, um, yeah, we get indications that 50% is kind of the upper end. The Criollo, yep, if they have to, they can traverse it, won't be happy about it, but definitely not in the Angus situation. All right, a few more slides about our different species of ungulates here. When we talk about annual production and how much forage in total is available, what about something like we see here? Well, none of these, none of our examples are gonna be very happy with this kind of landscape. Many of them would, would do fine, but when you compare that to something you know, lush, obviously the more forage we have, that's a great equalizer. All of these species here are gonna be pretty happy with the amount of forage and the, the uh, palatability. You know, it tastes good, it's nutritious here, um, and there's lots of it. So in almost every instance, all other things being equal, greater production means greater capacity. Okay, so what makes this and what we're about to get it more in depth about modern? It's because we're at the cutting edge of data. We have more data now describing these types of attributes than we've ever had before. Through the Rangeland Production Monitoring Service, RPMS, the Rangeland Analysis Platform, RAP, these give us long-term vegetation trends that we can mine and ask the question, are the vegetation trends changing? And we also have lots of high resolution vegetation type maps. So are we looking at cat claw acacia? Are we looking at creosote bush? Are we looking at purely herbaceous matter? Some of you may have heard of some of these mapping exercises, the, the INREV in region three, VCMQ, region four, VMAP in region one, CalVeg, uh, which is the state layer in region five. We also have more data about water points and very importantly to wild horse and burrows, cadastral, who owns the land. And I'll tell you why that's important in just a second. It also is much easier to ask what if questions. We can model a million acres uh, in 15 minutes now. It takes us two months to get there and get all the data together. But what if is very quick. And our processing techniques here, we're using slightly different uh, approach than, than Holacek would in just classifying you know, steep land versus non-steep land. We allow the slope the water and the vegetation all to interact simultaneously. And I'll give you some mathematics on how this would work. Let's look at our, our brief case study and how we actually put it together. So we were charged with working on a wild horse and burrow appropriate management level assessment. And that just means, you know, how many horses do we really think should be here? And that's in region five. And here's our main assumptions. We'll accept 30% utilization year to year. That means we'll only allow 30% of that available forage to be consumed um, across the landscape uh, because we, we want the plants to be able to maintain their reserves so we don't wanna eat them too much, all right? Uh, the horses go a maximum of five miles from water, forage on slopes less than or equal to 45%. And horses are assumed to require 1.2 AUMs. Don't get wrapped up, which is annual unit months. We don't wanna get wrapped up in all these different considerations that cows are bigger today than they were before. We're just using this as a benchmark. So what does that mean? It means we take 780 pounds of forage, which is more or less required for an animal unit month to support you know, one of these large ungulates for a month. Horses are bigger, so we, do the, we give it a fudge factor of 1.2, but there's 12 months in a year, so. Horses need about 10,300 pounds of forage per year, plus or minus, depending on what you look at. But those are the, that's our assumption here, okay? And we also found through fecal analysis and other things that the horses are using less than 2% of shrubs in their diet in this region. And of course, the preferences are gonna change. The horses, and particularly the burrows, will nibble the, the, uh, the brush species regularly in some cases, but not what we have there. So the Artemisia tridentata is the sagebrush, the Chrysothamnus nauseosus, the rubber rabbit brush, and these things, they're not really very palatable. So we can't include them in the forage pool. Well, that means we have to have 
maps that tell us where these species occur to cut them out of the pie. Okay, so we're getting modern as we go through this. And importantly, in this area, we have to allow for 2,977 animal unit months of forage for cattle grazing. Quickly do the math. That's 2,977. That's the number times 780 pounds per month times 12 months gives us roughly 2.3 million pounds that we need to reserve for the cattle. Okay, so here is our study area with all those concerns and all the data needed to address those concerns, here we are. As you can see, it's on the border of California and Nevada. There's lots of wild horses there and uh, not a lot of wildlife. So speaking with the professionals that, that work this land here, there's not a lot of deer to consider. So it's primarily the wild horse and burros and the other domesticated livestock we have to be concerned with. On the bottom, we have a vegetation map that has been classified in terms of the, the use. And, and in other words, how useful is it? Is it that cat claw acacia? Does it get a, you know, like a one or a zero kind of thing? So basically um, the shrubs are in the orange. The green is understory. So it's pinion and juniper. So we have to factor in what forage will be found there. Show you how we did that in a second. And in the black, that's a shrub herb mix. So we have to pull out just the herbaceous portion because again, the shrubs are less than 2% of the diet. We really don't want much of that going into the formulation of capacity. And the gray is no forage available at all. And the white lines here represent um, vegetation type polygons uh, from the different projects that, that contributed to this work. Primarily the cow veg and the VCMQ is what we blended together to make this map work. Um, so we have water to consider. And here are our water points for our wild horse and burrow AML assessment. So water points are here, pastures are in yellow. Um, but I told you we needed cadastral information. And the reason for that is the Wild Horse and Burrow Act is, precludes us from using anything off of federal land um, to include in this AML. So if we just were naive to, to land ownership, we're gonna come up with a very different, you know, um, kind of letter of the law estimate of appropriate management level. Um, than if we had the, the, the ownership. So we need to subtract private lands and state lands out of this mix because we cannot include that by the act in the assessment. Okay, so we have our terrain factors that we're going to evaluate, you know, how far can they go from water, the wild horse and burros, and how steep. Well, remember we said 45% slope was the upper end. And we also said water was five miles. Okay, well, let's think about this for a second. We can buffer our water points out to five miles, five miles being the worst score, you know, and right next to the water is the best score, okay? But at two and a half miles, we're halfway. So we get a value of 0 0.5. We're halfway along that, that curve or that slope. Same with the, the slope. So at 22 and a half percent slope, we're halfway. If we interact those two terms, 0.5 and 0.5, we get a terrain correction of 0.25 because that's basically saying in this instance, those wild horse and burrows, wherever we have a half score for water and half score for slope, they're only going to be there about a quarter of the time they will to more favorable areas. And because they're not going to, you know, they're not going to range 10 miles from water. They're not going to go straight up the mountainside. And so that's what this forage correction factor map shows us. In areas that are cool tones, that's better. Those are areas where we get a higher score than, than the warmer tones. Warmer tones are steeper or further from water. Okay, when we throw this all in and we say, forget about the terrain for a second, just tell us about the productivity, you know, how productive is it, how much forage is being produced overall without consideration, can they reach it, how far from slope or how far from water, the slope, et cetera. We, we come up with a value of about 600 horses uh, on average, just based on the total productivity, assuming they were all across the landscape in equal proportion. Wow, uh, that's a pretty big number. And so our pounds per acre map is shown here. And again, without any of the correction factors we've mentioned. So this modern idea and bringing that data is really gonna matter, you're gonna see it. All right. I want to talk about understory production. This is a real stinker. Nobody has a good answer for it. However, 
the group we worked with in region five sampled a lot of vegetation. And what we ended up with is a bad curve, but a reasonable curve where we see tree cover on the X, that's percent canopy cover and forage production on the Y and that's pounds per acre. So we're talking really low levels of forage under those trees. And it varies as a function of canopy cover. On the upper end, it's 20 pounds per acre. That's not very much forage, but this gave us something to stand on to say, well, we're going to permit, we're going to permit um, this forage to vary that way under the canopy. Okay, let's look at the numbers we arrived at, applying all this information together at once. The understory data um, and all the productivity concerns and the terrain corrections and everything. There's two more pieces to the puzzle here in this wild horse and burrow assessment in region five. We had winter water sources and summer water sources. So do we want to assume the horses can range far enough in the winter to, to get the different, you know, to get the summer water or not? And this is where it gets kind of tricky with water. So we did two different assessments, one assuming winter water, one assuming summer water. And we had um, two different estimates here uh, based on that. So let's take a look. We have, look at the table here. It's a matrix above average year on the top. In the middle is an average year. And this is the number of horses, okay? The number of horses that that much forage can support given all those factors we talked about. So above average, average, and below average. Okay, and the reason we have that variability is because with these long-term data sets we've been using, again, the modern approach, we have data from 1984 to 2021 and beyond um, regarding the forage productivity. So from that, we can derive the variability year to year and make some estimates about bad years, good years, and average years. And that's how we arrived at that. So one more time, going back to the numbers, take a look at the numbers in the middle here. Keep your eye on that for a second. So they range from 246 here in the, in the winter water scenario, 288, not a big difference, or an average of about 270 horses on average. But on the low end, you notice that average drops to about 146, 150. Let's unwrap this just one more time. So our total terrain corrected forage is about 12 million pounds. When we interact all the terms, and we use all the data sets we talked about, but remember, we have to account for the cattle, and we hadn't take we hadn't we hadn't done that just yet. Okay, so if we just assumed horses, we got 12.2 million pounds of forage. And you spread it out over the critters you want to, given the assumptions we've laid out, the 30% utilization, blah blah blah. Okay, we account for the cattle here at about 2.3 million pounds, it only leaves us 9.8, 9.9 million pounds somewhere in there. On average, horses need 10,296. So we end up with about 961 horses. What happened? You know, I showed you the other table that, uh, you know, we came up with numbers that were closer to 150 to 200. Well, horses, um, you know, you got to remember, we, we said we had to allow for 30% utilization. So 961 times 0.3 yields 288 horses that we're going to say is an appropriate, possibly an appropriate management level there. Um, I want to talk a bit more about the shrubs for a second because it really mattered in this story. It was huge. It was a game changer. If we have, think, consider, for example, we have 200 pounds per acre of forage and a terrain correction factor of 0.5. So we have 100 pounds that's available that could be used, but horses are only eating 2% shrubs in the model. Okay, so let's assume we have 100 pounds of shrub productivity that is available to the horses, but we're only allowing 2% because we see from the fecal analysis and other things, they don't like very many shrubs here. So out of that 100 pounds of total, they only get, we're only going to allow two in the calculus. And that really changed things. When we put it all together, we kept hitting numbers, 600 horses, 700 horses until one day they said, or I asked, so the horse is eating shrubs that much? No, 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 it's 2%. Well, then it dropped it down to that, around that 288 to 250 range. 
So the shrubs mattered a ton, completely changed the story uh, here in this case study. So this stuff really does work because I'll tell you, they were thinking there would be a number of about 220 plus or minus. Um, so I wanna, I wanna wrap up by talking about, again, the modern elements of this approach. But the approach isn't new, but how we bring everything together kind of is. We have herb, shrub, and tree cover from the range analysis platform from 1984 to present. So you can leverage that through your analysis. We have productivity from the rangeland production monitoring service. We have cadastral from Pattis. We have plot data from region four, the understory function I showed you. You know, what, how many pounds per acre based on the canopy cover. And then we have the CalVeg data set. We have water from region five, region four, and the BLM who participated here. And using all this information, we can ask virtually unlimited what if questions. Again, 10 minutes to model about a million acres once we have it all together. And this brings everything under one umbrella with our assumptions of herbivory, you know, the type of animal. Are we talking criollo? Are we talking about Angus? Are we talking about antelope, deer? Because that those assumptions need to be changed in the model. But once you have the model construct, it's just a fudge factor here. Um, so wrapping up, I want to talk about currently, there are about 200 horses. We started with no knowledge of this. And we said that based on all the factors we discovered, we said that, and I showed you this table before, that on average, we think on an average year, 267, but a below average year, 146. So somewhere between 267 and 146 should be a number where we feel pretty comfortable relatively conservatively. And that put us about 200. So I didn't know there was 200 horses there, but they told me that at the end. So we feel pretty good about stating that it's pretty close to the appropriate management level. Now, why do I show you this map here? This is what changes the game and enables us to really leverage technology. We said, yeah, we're probably at AML, but let's say people came in and said, no way, we wanna manage to the upper end. Okay, that'd give us 350 to 400 horses. Uh, well, not so fast. What you're looking at is the trend in perennial forb and grass cover from 1984 to 2020. The warm tones mean that forage pool is slipping downhill over time. Cool tones mean it's increasing. I see more warm tones than cool tones here, but we can quantify that if we need to. So using our approach, we can take this trend map and we can project ahead using that, that trajectory and say, okay, you might think it's, you know, maybe the AML is 267 now, but what if we stay on this trajectory? What does the calculus look like? And it would be somewhat less in 10 years than it is now. Will it stay that way? I don't know. But this kind of modern approach enables you to, to do that and ask the what if questions. So I know I left a lot, out a lot of details because you could go, go on and on. Uh, but I, I, I hope that I was clear enough so that you understand in general what we're after here. And if you want to be a project partner and you want to talk about capacity of different critters with all kinds of considerations that we've we've talked about here and many others that we haven't, including the phenology and how it varies. Um, just give us a call and uh, myself and, and, and partners throughout the Forest Service and the BLM. Uh, it's, it really is a very nice working group to work on a project like this. So if you have an interest in that, let us know for things like NEPA and planning and allotment management, this type of tool is, is becoming very useful for a lot of questions. And we're really ramping up, uh, especially in region three for the NEPA exercises to make sure that these trends that I just showed you aren't significantly impacting the numbers up or down because we'd want to document that. Again, my name's Matt Reeves and contact me anytime with uh, interest or questions about these projects. Perfect, Matt, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, yes, and at this point, um, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and um, turn on your cameras and raise your hand if you'd like to um, make this a little bit more personal for Matt to ask questions. But um, for right now, I will read the first um, question. 
Okay, so it's from Mike Popejoy. Um, it says this, the case study used 30% utilization in cattle AAUMs as fixed. On many forest service allotments, this isn't possible where utilization regularly exceeds 60% and there are no wild horses or burrows. How would you suggest applying your approach to this kind of management situation? Well, in what, I, what we would do is in consultation with stakeholders, determine a range that we would want to evaluate and then plot a number. I mean, if all we're changing is the assumption uh, of, of how much is actually being consumed, then that's, that is a one line parameter in a model this way. You know, we have to dumb it down a little bit and just make it a model parameter, which we do, but you'd plug in a 0.3, maybe a 0.4, a 0.5, a 0.6, a 0.7, a 0.8, and see what the numbers look like. And then collectively, everyone would dialogue about it and see how reasonable they think, but you're right. And the other, the other thing we could consider is, I don't believe that, in many cases, we see something as high as 60% utilization across an entire area. There are probably, and maybe I'm wrong, but we would get that through consultation. Probably what happens is as a distance from water and slope and you know, the best stuff gets hit 60, 70, 80%. And then as we radiate away to the less desirable conditions, there is less use. So what we could do is we could make a function um, in addition to what we've already uh, generated, in other words, the distance from water and slope, we could add some other concerns or some other quantitative factors to account for that. But it would be easy to make a number of runs and then look at what people think. And I did see that Mike popped on camera. So Mike, did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thanks, Matt. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Meg Amersted. Um, it is, where did the forage production map come from? Was it remote data source? Yeah, and I wasn't very clear on data sources, my bad. Um, it came from the Rangeland Production Monitoring Service, which stems from the same remotely sensed um, time series that everybody is using right now for this type of work, which is thematic mapper. So it's 30 meters in spatial resolution. And we have 1984 to 2020, uh, 2022 actually it's and beyond. Um, so it's from our production monitoring service and that's calibrated against um, a ton of types of, of different types of productivity studies and information. It works better where there's a relatively higher herbaceous content I feel very good about it in a lot of cases. Areas where shrubs are to be concerned, it becomes a little harder. But that's where it came from is the Rangeland Production Monitoring Service. If you have an interest in forage information across the landscape, contact me and I'll help you get set up with that. And there are other labs in the area doing that type of work. So that's not a publicly available database we have to go through the research station? Yeah, it's publicly available. Some data sets are easier to get than others. There's different types of caveats, but absolutely publicly available. Uh, there's no holds barred here. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. I would definitely recommend contacting Matt though. He's great to work with. So don't be afraid to contact him. <laughs> Um, all right, great. Thanks, Meg, for that question. Did he answer everything? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, the next question is from Sherman Swanson. Um, it says, given that horses concentrate at riparian areas even more than cattle, and that riparian areas are critical to many and most wildlife species, if their condition was valued, how would that have limited carrying capacity? Well, what we would do would be to, again, work in consultation with the, the groups. Um, we would either apply, we would either have long, there's a variety of approaches we could employ here. Let me think about this a second. Um, but it would all come from working with people. And because we don't know everything from 740 kilometers in space, uh, what we could do is put, um, you know, hypothetical boundaries. Like, let's say, for example, we wanted to lay out some virtual fencing around these areas. And finally, um, I'm just being hypothetical, 
Um, we could, you know, hypothetically exclude areas and see what difference it would make. Um, or we could look at the trend information that would be available at those areas. Obviously, the horses are going to spend a lot of time there chasing the other wildlife out. Um, quantitatively, it'd be a little bit difficult with the types of data we've talked about here to make it work. And I do believe it would just have to come with a lot of give and take and consultation with people. As you, as you know, Sherm, uh, a lot of these wild horse and burrow issues are, are near and dear to people's hearts on both sides of the argument. And uh, I don't believe there are too many clear answers there. So sure. uh, pregnant pause, I'll, I'll uh, take that as an invitation <laughs> to comment a little bit. Um, I became quite concerned about this riparian grazing issue with um, um, free roaming horse and burrow management issues in the last years of my career. And, and we did put up uh, trail cams at 10 um, meadows that are were prior, in priority sage grouse habitat because um, meadows are really important for late brood rearing for sage grouse. And uh, out of the million seven hundred thousand um, time lapse photographs that we took, we found that the horses were using those meadows at twice the rate of livestock, and about twenty times the rate, almost twenty times the rate of wild ungulates, um, antelope, deer, elk, etc. And um, and they were all functioning at risk. Many were apparently on a downward trend, although we don't have quantitative data to document the trend. But I was delighted to hear you talk about trend. Um, my sense is that we can manage for riparian areas with a fairly high stocking rate of cattle by movement of animals to provide recovery periods, but we can't do that with free roaming horses and burros. And I kind of I think that um, riparian areas are the hot spots that are probably going to govern carrying capacity in many desert, especially environments. And of course, most of our free roaming horses live in very arid landscapes. Um, and, um, and your study is certainly an example of that. Did you have riparian resources in these areas? Were your waters riparian or were they more like water troughs? There were both. Um, water is limited and becoming more so. The BLM and the Forest Service both provided their, their water areas. They had some historical um, kind of uh, spring and stream data, but they said they're all dry. And so we had, they, I, I couldn't do it. They had to go through and kind of hand draw and pick the ones that are still functioning where they think the horses will be hanging out. And one thing you could do here is if you just wanted to focus on that question, you would assign, even though we think the horses can go, you know, a long distance from the flat uh, water areas, uh, you know, the flat areas that, uh, you know, maybe up to uh, five miles of water, you can adjust the slope of that so that you say, yeah, that sounds good on paper, but in reality, the horses are camping out in these vegetation types, this distance from water, and then begin to show not, not, not uh, how many horses do we think could be here, but instead, where do we think the most likely areas would be for degradation? continuing in the future. So we just flip the model a little bit and the left-hand side would would be an indicator of where things are likely to continue to get worse, if you know yeah. what I mean. And of course you could do things like that with anything that creates a hot spot that is really valuable. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the classic example of this uh, from recent decades has been riparian areas, but certainly other forage resources could also be uh, in critically short supply and really important to some TES species or um, for some other valued reason. Um, thank you very much, appreciate it. Yes. Great, thanks Sherman for that question and that discussion. Um, I just wanna remind our continuing credits um, for this webinar series and I just pasted the link to the form where you can fill out your information to receive those credits. And um, just to notice too, David Wright um, just posted in there um, a publication by um, Matt that's related to this uh, topic today. So um, the next question is uh, from Karen Claus. Um, she says, I didn't hear harvest efficiency mentioned, but presume that was wrapped up in the 30% utilization. That kind of 
HE seems pretty high for the terrain and shrub dominated communities to achieve greater than 50% actual use for plant health. Also air dry weight of one AUM is 912 pounds per acre is the model RPMS reporting out, uh, reporting oven dry weight to equate to the 780 pounds per acre instead. Yeah, so RPMS just looks at the landscape and estimates the, the, the total annual productivity with, it's totally naive to annual unit months. And the AUM presented here at 780 pounds uh, per month is a factor that the group wanted to use. Um, I, you can, we can uh, debate this and the size of animals and the differences of AUMs a little bit. That would be, that's one of the beauties of, um, you know, a modeling approach like this, it's one line in the whole code. So if you if you really wanted to to flip that to 912, then it's 912, um, no problem. Uh, so back to the 30% uh, use, yes, but remember the shrubs were only allowed at 2%. So in reality, and I didn't want to get this down this far in the weeds. So although we said that, um, you know, on average, they wanted to and um, make an estimate of thirty percent use um, uh, in in the shrub areas. It would just be limited to two percent, and in a lot of cases, especially with the burrows, we find it's much higher than that. But not with the shrub species in this neck of the woods. I don't know if that helps or not. But the nice thing about the modeling approach is every Every time you want to change assumptions, you can actually develop, you know, a time series of these final maps. I just showed one slice of an infinite number of combinations. What you can do is model this, say, 100 times and vary each parameter and then get surfaces and find out where all the sweet spots are. For example, slope, 30% assumption, 50%, 60%, 80%. Distance from water, one mile, two mile, three mile, four mile. And same way with the use, 50, 40, 30, 10, you know, on down. And also that variability over time. So let's say it's uh, on average a thousand pounds, but it varies 30% per year. And that's something I didn't mention. And this area here is an extremely variable environment with respect to the productivity, which is indicated by the productivity monitoring service. And it varies on average. Um, about 40% a year from 1984 to present day. So we have an average and we can model it above average and a below average. So it's a moving target and it's an art as much as it is science. Hopefully that answered your question, Karen. Um, so the next question up here is um, from Meg again. It says, with your work with public land grazing permits, how did historic permitted numbers compare to carrying capacity calculations? How does this play into vegetation availability trend? Um, I don't know anything about the historically permitted numbers, which may be related to the trend map we saw. I don't know. I presume it's a combination of drought and also uh, animal numbers, but I don't know about the history per se. Uh, but they would they would impact if it's just it's just a fudge factor in the model. The model's dumb. It doesn't know much about anything. It just does all the calculations for us. So if there was more managed herbivory, and by managed, I don't mean the horses. I mean they're just running wherever they feel like it. But the yeah, as Sherm mentioned, but with the the other livestock, sheep and and in this case, cattle, if the numbers of cattle were higher in the past then in the past, the amount of forage estimated to be available for horses would be commensurately lower. And that's how it would play into the vegetation availability trend. So it's just applying a variety of assumptions on top of each other to figure that out. I don't know well, if that makes sense, Meg, or not. I, maybe I didn't. I guess my question is more so when you're looking at cattle grazing permits, and the same kind of forage availability analysis with water and slope. I mean, I'm guessing that my forest permits didn't take those into consideration when we were allocating numbers back in you know, the 70s. Um, my guess is my numbers are probably over allocated. And so I guess like 
with the trend we're seeing of lower forage availability, I guess I was just curious if you've seen a difference between what your calculations are saying is available and then what the public land is actually permitting. Oh, well, we didn't look at the cattle specifically. You know, there would be a different set of fudge factor for those, as you as you know. Um, so we didn't look at the, the cattle. I just knew based on consultation with those folks that, hey, by the way, there's also a good number of other livestock here we need to take into account, and this is the number. We did not look at the historical impact, which would be uh, an important thing to do as we're peeling back the layers of the onion. It is interesting to note, most of that region there has experienced a reduction in perennials as that map indicated. We can argue all day long about, is it this bounce per acre, is it this cover? But overall, the trends from remotely sensed information are pretty good. Um, so if they indicate downward trend, I would believe it. And then do you have any other case studies focusing more on um, domestic livestock raising versus wild horses and burros? Yeah, so the examples in region three, which we did not go over for the NEPA uh, implications, there's about 20 allotments there being evaluated and looking at what we're going to do there is take this several steps further. And we look at areas where trends are going up, down, or sideways, and what that means for the forage available. And then we don't assign causality, but we look at things like the rainfall over the last 60 or 70 years uh, by month. And then we look at things like, well, how many elk have come into the picture? How many livestock have, and try and begin to understand, okay, we see this trend here. What do we think might be driving it? Is it the, the livestock permitted? Is it the bighorn sheep? Is it the elk? We don't know. It's a moving target, as you know, in some cases. Thanks for that discussion. I think Mike has another uh, question. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Um, hey, Matt, I was curious uh, what you think the possibilities might be to include drought and precip forecasting into your model? I guess what I'm thinking of is, could your model be used, say, yearly in a particular area to estimate you know, what the carrying capacity might be um, for that year, given what's expected um, you know, a month out, three months out, et cetera? Yes, so there is a, this is more of a strategic evaluation. As I've shown, you have the median, the middle of the road, and we have kind of an upper and then kind of a lower bound based on that almost 40% plus or minus variability that we've seen. But while we might have 40% variability, that does not, in the description that we're talking about, take into account this trend. And the tactical uh, application here, if you think you have a good forecast of, of drought and forage availability, God bless you, we can, we can use that. We do have uh, the fuel cast information, which is a projection of forage and fuels within the growing season, it starts four months ahead of the peak. So it's a Google Earth uh, uh, um, a deployed artificial intelligence application where we use precip we use eddy, uh, a drought metric, and remote sensing, a weekly data feed. And what happens is um, it, it looks back two years and says, OK, this is what's going on right here over the last two years. And then it asks the question, well, when we've seen these conditions in the past over the last 50 years, where did we end up? So it's kind of like an analog scenario to, to say, well, we've had two inches of rain already. What does that tan amount to by the peak of the season? So we could plug that directly in and ask the question, you know, normally we think the low end is a thousand pounds per acre, but honestly, we're projecting, you know, uh, 2000 or 200. So you could plug that in. Quantitatively, it's no problem. The question becomes how much do you believe it? Of course, a forecast. Great, thanks. Th this seemed like a good place to um, put in the plug for Matt's um... He has a, a West Wide Rangeland Fuel Assessment um, webinar that he just started up yesterday. Um, and we just popped the, David popped the link in there um, for that. And then also the flyer um, that has to do with that fuel cast system that Matt was just referring to. So check that out if you're interested. 
Yeah, there's other episodes there too. I think we've been doing that for two or three years. So there's uh, mm-hmm. the reading the tea leaves has been up and running for a little bit. We just interpret in plus or minus seven minutes or less what we think those forecasts are going to yield. But it's different topics depending on what what the big uh, the big picture is that's emerging. For the 2021, right. for this one, it's about oh, we started out the year horribly in the southwest and we ended up pretty good because of the in in some cases because of the monsoon etc the great reversal yeah check it out it just aired yesterday so all right well we're coming up on the on the hour here um does anybody else want to turn on the cameras raise their hands or pop a question into the chat all right well, this has been a great discussion. Um, it's been really great to see um, all the people that have joined are just from everywhere, Colorado, BC, Canada, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Oregon, Idaho, <laughs> um, North Dakota, you name it. So um, we've had a great audience and we appreciate uh, you joining us today. And thank you, Matt, for your presentation. And let's see, we do have um, our future webinar series is going to continue. Um, the next one up is on uh, March 9th, um, and that will be on Obi-Wan, uh, estimating property level carbon storage using NASA's JEDI LIDAR with um, Sean Healy and Young. So please join us next week, next week if you can. And uh, please feel free to contact Matt, too, if you have any questions. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.